What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode. I'm really excited to have my good friend, Chris Ward. Today, we talk about culture, how she was working 16 hours a day and dropped it to six, how you can build a team around yourself to do that thing, and just lots of other really, really great stuff. I truly believe if you are an entrepreneur, which you probably are, if you're listening to this, you're going to get a lot out of this episode. So let's drop in and hear what she has to say. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another great episode of the Guya Now Show. I am your host, Bob McIntosh. And today I have with me my good friend, Chris Ward, who we uh, have known each other for about 10 years. We were just trying to figure that out, but pretty, pretty close to it. Uh, and she is a former photographer and now marketer because she kind of spun that into that. She has her own amazing uh, podcast called Win the Hour, Win the Day, which is also the title of your book. And I'm sure we'll be talking a little bit about that later. Um, but the the thing, uh, one of the things that was really funny is I said she was a, a former photographer and she did a marketing shoot for me, um, like for my business way, way back, you know, when I was a, a very different Bob. And one of the funny things that she said to me that still sticks with me to this day, whenever I'm doing a photo shoot and whenever I am thinking about marketing or taking a picture of myself or Instagram or anything like that is she said, you have to smile with your eyes. Keep smiling with your eyes. Now you know why all the models do cocaine so they can keep smiling. <laughs> with their eyes <laughs> and, and i'm just like and it's funny because i literally i'm like okay i gotta smile better i gotta smile better i need some cocaine i'm just kidding i don't actually need cocaine but um it's it's a funny story and it's something that has stuck with me despite the fact that you know we don't get to see each other all the time um but she is a uh, badass entrepreneur has done a lot of really really cool things um she's from our sister country canada a eh? i have to drop in a eh? i can't not do it <laughs> um and i'm very very excited that she's here um, like I said, she's a she's a badass in her own right. And so I think we have a lot to, that we can learn from each other. Well, I'm, that sounds like a good intro to me. So I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Perfect. So for those who don't know you, which I'm imagining is most everybody on this call, probably mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about your journey, you know, kind of what you're doing now and, and how you got there. Oh boy, <laughs> that's a lot. So yeah, you're right, Bob. I started out as a, as a photographer and Oh boy, that quickly grew into other things because it was really, I was working with business professionals, entrepreneurs. And so one thing led to the other and it's your biggest marketing asset is your, is the photography. So, you know, I kind of outgrew that where the company grew and I needed someone then to do the photography for me and I would direct the campaigns and that evolved. And so then I would proudly call myself a marketing strategist after diving into that for a period of time. And then I guess where we took another turn with when the hour, when the day is, um, you know, like so many entrepreneurs, I was working insane hours for a couple of years, like, oh my heavens, as my husband always said, I was constantly <laughs> stealing from sleep. Right. And right. I thought I was a warm and charming person, but you go months and months without sleep and that buffer of charm starts to melt away. So the people that you're I supporting that. that are supporting you, you're kind of snappy at them and that doesn't work. So I thought, wow, I can't do this for another 10 years. I was really exhausted and always just in pure fatigue mode, you know? So I thought, well, how can we do this differently? So I started to really examine productivity and team building and just like with a real feverish hunger for how do we make this different, this journey different? And, uh, you know, cause I, I got a lot done in a day. So I just kept thinking there was too much to get done because I was pretty organized. I got a lot of things done, but it was never enough. So when I started looking at productivity and team building, I really went from 16 hours a day down to six. And what happened was I realized, oh my heavens, how hard I had been working against myself. I was so in my own way, Bob. I was running myself into the ground and I was so, so super hyper counterproductive. It was unbelievable. So what a difference that made and things turned around for me and I just couldn't believe how much more effective this was for me, my business, my health, my family, everything. And luckily it did because it was a couple of years after that, that my husband had been diagnosed with colon cancer. I'd been pulled away from the company for a couple of years. And when I returned after his passing, um, my company was not only still alive, it was, it was not just surviving, but it was thriving. It was growing. And my existing marketing uh, clients had no idea of my absence. We didn't feel it would be good for business. We were very positive in nature. We didn't really want to talk about it a lot. So it was a well-kept compartmentalized issue and no one knew. And so they were just shocked. How did I pull that off? So they started to ask me under the capacity of, you know, team building and time management and productivity. How did I swing that? And so of course, having a fragility or appreciation for the fragility of life, I started working with them under that capacity 
because I believe your business should support your life, not consume it. And it is really the backbone to getting out of your own way. And uh, that's how Win the Hour, Win the Day was born. And from that, the book, and you know, we have a podcast as well where we discuss general business and stuff like that. But the real passion is having a business that supports your life instead of consuming it. And that's so important. I, you know, I know for myself, especially, I can find myself in that mode of just grind, grind, grind. It's actually interesting. Yeah. I'm, I'm in Austin, Texas right now, and I've been taking, making sure very poignantly taking time to, on my, on my weekends, um, primarily to explore the city. Cause I was like, you know, I didn't want to left to my own devices. I might find myself just like, you know, grinding away. Cause I don't know a lot of people here. It's, you know, it's new. It, it's, you know, I don't have an existing friend base. It's like hitting me up to go do things. So it could be very easy to find myself in that space. Uh, but making a point not to is, is huge. So I, I want to ask you, you said something that I, I think, and by the way, for all of you listening right now, I think this is super important. This is why I'm excited that she's here we get caught up in that grind mode that, you know, everyone says grind, grind, grind. You got to work like crazy hours. Right. And don't get me wrong. Like, I'm not going to say that there isn't times when that needs to happen, but if it's every single day, all the time, you know, for years, there's something wrong. And I think that's what we can learn from, from Chris here. So I, I want to dive a little deeper in that. You said that you dropped from 16 hours to six. Mm -hmm. That's a huge difference, mm -hmm. huge mm -hmm. difference. So what, like, what would be the 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 biggest contributing factors to that for you or, or things that you changed? Was that mindset? Was it like, I'm curious. Well, let's be clear. It did not happen overnight. Okay. Of course. So, you just like but, decide like, oh, I'm yeah. just going to cut out 10 hours. No big deal. This was, Yeah. Yeah. So I should be able to get that into play Monday and be having it mastered <laughs> by Tuesday. So it did not happen overnight. But there was a lot of things that I learned really quickly, right? So, you know, for me, I learned the power of outsourcing. And I just, you know, so many entrepreneurs we buy into that grinding thing. You're right, Bob. And that grinding thing, I look, I've never met an entrepreneur that needed to be told to keep going and the inspiration, all that stuff. Like, you know, you got to work harder. That's not, I don't, I've just never met that entrepreneur. But what happens is you see all this stuff online and this beating your chest and, you know, bloody knuckles and grinding it out. Honestly, that's just making a glory, like, glory of an ill-planned journey. That's my belief. Right. I believe what doesn't kill you makes you really tired, okay? So when you <laughs> see this raw, raw stuff online, that's just somebody trying to get attention for what I call an ill-planned journey. So there is that aspect of it. And what I was doing was having to unlearn all these poor habits that I had bought into, like, oh, this is how this is how the big boys and girls do it, right? Right. So I started to look at anything that I could really examine and make it a little bit more efficient. And 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 we're living in this magical time of outsourcing. That's why I'm all about creating your win team, your what is next team. But for me as a, a marketing strategist at the time. Now I went online like many years before anybody else because they just realized you can have back-to-back -back appointments on the computer. You don't even have to include 10 minutes for driving. You right. can show them your screen, blah, blah, blah. But like about, you know, nine years ago when I was still going to offices and I'd sit down and I'd be making notes and I, all this stuff and marketing packages are very specific. And I would promise hand to God when I got to the car that, you know, listen, I'll make some notes, blah, blah, blah. When I get back to the office, this is fine. I take my notes and it'll go in the computer. It'll be fine. And often what would happen is not this Friday, but next Friday, <laughs> these notes would get into the computer. And then I got the opportunity to be one of two people. The first one was if they called, they could, I know they could hear me scrambling, trying to put my notes together and figure out stuff. Or I might misquote them because you know, these notes are meant for 20 minutes, not for two weeks. And then I look like I'm trying to swindle them, but I'm not, I'm just not prepared. So who wants that? So I hired someone to do transcriptions for me. And what would happen is I would leave the office that, you know, my, my potential client's office, sit in the car. I would talk into my phone for like 30 seconds. It would be up within hours. Now here's the thing. Some weeks I had no meetings. Other weeks I had three or four hours of meetings. But the, because this transcriptionist, it's all she did and all she liked to do, she was really, really good at it. So the weeks that I needed her for three or four hours cost me like 12 bucks. And I was like, That's oh, crazy. I was always from the mindset of I, if I do it myself, I'm saving money. Who can afford a team? I'm kind of new. You know, I don't I'm not making enough money yet to start paying people full time. And like you are from the mindset of a background of an employee. So right. I was just always in my own way. So that's how it started to unfold for me. That's perfect. That's perfect. So, so you start plugging in. So the 16 hours is, and I want to be clear, 
some of it's outsourcing other things that you needed to do, but just didn't need necessarily be done by you. It wasn't just like, oh, I magically reorganized my day to eliminate 10 hours of work. No, it took time. And it was me chipping away, taking a look at everything I was doing. Is it because I was what I, I call myself now a recovering Russiaholic. So <laughs> what I was doing constantly was just go, 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 trying to outrun the clock, just go as fast as I can. And that does not give lend itself to the opportunity of being more effective, more creative. It's just not how the science of the brain works, right? So when you're going full tilt ahead, constantly, constantly, you know, you're not getting more effective. You're just going, you're just a rushaholic. So I wasn't examining anything. I wasn't, you know, in any capacity of making things more efficient. And I also had the governing mindset that if I did this myself, it would save money. Perfect. So what's your mindset now? If it's not to save money, is it, is it, this makes me money? So my mindset now is really that what I teach all my coaching clients is I think for many entrepreneurs, you're about in 80% of admin and what I call the web of admin. Now I'm constantly looking at, you know, it should be 60% creation, 40% admin. Okay. So with my podcast, when the hour, when the day, it's all general business. It could be anything from sales, social media, whatever you've been on it, Bob, spectacular mm -hmm. guest. Everyone should tune in, just listen to Bob. And right now excuse me, we're looking at doubling our output so that we're going to do two shows a week, okay. but we have finagled that. So what's going to happen is we will double our output, but our work is going to increase 12%. All right. Wow. So 12% of an increase in work but doubling our output. So it's really about, because I don't need that podcast as much as we love it. We don't need it consuming all our time because we have to get to the next thing. We have to get to my second book. We, we need to constantly can be compressing and keeping the admin part 40% so we can be in the creation part 60%. That's perfect. That's perfect. So what, what advice would you give to someone who's like, okay, Chris, I, I like this. This idea sounds good. I could start chipping away at, at my day. Where do I start? What things do I start to think about chipping off to somebody else? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, it's probably one of the most common questions we get on our website, www.whenthehourwhentheday.com. And what I would say is so many people think, okay, I'll get a VA and then I will do a couple of things. I'll just start dumping stuff from my desk to her desk. And that's just moving a pile of work, but it doesn't really change the framework in which how you operate or worse. I call this pulling a Chris <laughs> is just say, <laughs> Oh, I'll come in Sunday and I'm going to work really hard and create all these systems. So when I hire that new person, she'll have them. But what will happen is they're not tested systems. They're going on memory. And the first time somebody goes through them, they'll realize, oh, yeah, this works, this works. But I don't have the password for this or this happens on Tuesday, but not Wednesday. So what I'd say is start small, start simple. OK, now when we do this, a big part of what we do with our coaching clients is we help you with the onboarding and the hiring and making sure everything's in place so that when you do bring somebody on, you're ready, because that's a big mistake. There's a lot of agencies out there now that will say, oh, we've got outsources for you. We've vetted them and they give them to you and they may be great at what they do, but you're you may not be set up for them. And so they're new to you and then you're new to them and then you don't have an infrastructure that you know, really lends itself to getting work done. So now you find that more work. So you're, I don't have time to do that. And it just all peters out. So what I would say is some of the strategies are, you know, even when we're working with a coaching client, we go out and we hire somebody for them or, or, and they meet them before they're officially hired. We teach them like, look, let's start small. She's going to work five hours this week, even if you want her full time. Let's get success there. Let's get the infrastructure in play. And then we grow an effective infrastructure versus, you know, what we call our super toolkits. I mean, people talk about systems and they sound really boring and heavy. That's because you're thinking of the mindset of corporate where they were just put in play for liability and they weren't meant to be tweaked, made user friendly. They're usually written by somebody who didn't do the job. So <laughs> start all too simple. often. Yeah. Just start simple and then start growing on that. Perfect. Perfect. And, and so is there certain things that you feel like someone should look at outsourcing first, like in terms of actual activities, like, you know, or like I've always, for me personally, at least I've always gone by it. Like if I hate doing this, it's the thing I want to outsource first. 
Um, is that is do you, do you think that's a great way to go about it, or is that am I totally off base? No, you're never off base, Bob. It's your show. You're always going to be right. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely I, not. I'm definitely not. Always, and here, I, here's the funny part. I learn more from this show. I don't. I, I you know, I, to be honest, if you're watching and listening, drop me a note and let me know you actually learn or, or find this helpful. I, even if no one else does. I do, so I'm gonna keep doing yeah. it for myself. But uh, I would love to know that other people are being impacted too, because I know I'm not always right, and I always learn things from these shows. Every, like every single show, I've learned at least one thing, if not more. Yeah, me too. I I call them like free coaching <laughs> sessions. Right. I get these guests on; they teach me something. It's spectacular. So no, you're not way off. I think that's a wonderful philosophy, but I also think, to be honest, Bob, that it takes some confidence. All right, okay. you've got confidence, you got some swagger, so you are confident enough that you go, all right, I don't like doing this, so I'm confident that I could hire somebody to do it because I don't want to do it. Where for often for most people, that's a fear based thing. Like I don't like doing it. I, I'm not doing it well. Mm. I have to learn how to figure that out first before I hand it off to somebody else. So not everybody has your confidence. What I would say to you is I think that we really truly live in a world of copy and paste. And there's a lot of pre and post production work. And I call it the three D's. You're damaging overhead, diminished opportunity, delayed income. And so often, you know, you think I'm saving money like I thought and thinking, oh, this is you know, but what it is, no matter what you sell, let's keep it simple and say you sell something, a package for a hundred bucks. Now you're doing this pre and post work or admin work. And now it's a hundred bucks an hour. You'd never pay somebody to do that ever. Right? So right. what I say is, you know, depending what you're doing really you, often a VA is a great support. I think a big mistake a lot of people make is they outsource to social media and they're not clear. They'll be like, mm. oh, I want somebody for social media. Well, what do you want? Do you want them writing the post? Do you want them just posting your copy? Do you want them tweaking the pictures? Do you want them to know the back end? There's a lot of components there. Now, I'm not mm -hmm. suggesting you have five people for social media, but I am suggesting you need to be super clear on what you're doing. That's the big mistake is they just put this out there and then think, oh, I'll just bring somebody in and they'll clean up this hot mess. And it doesn't work like that. You're in your right, own right. way again. So you, you need you need them to understand what your objective is and what you're trying to accomplish with them taking it over. And you then need also, to also simplify your objective. Okay, perfect. I think that's no, that's huge. Simplify your objective because if you don't, I mean, 100 have been guilty of this with VAs in the past. Is like, yeah, like here's I just like here it is, and they're like they they get lost in the 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 day to day of it, the the minutia of it because. For you, it's or for me at least, it was simple, right? I already because I already have it all in my head, but they don't have any of that, and so there's no way to easily download it from my brain. Which, whenever that becomes a thing, will be insane, but not yet. <laughs> God help us. That is the big. That is the super biggest problem. Is that brain thing? Like you just know this, and then nobody else knows it. That is totally you getting in your own way, and that's also what I call really that social media example is diluting it. It's kind of back in the day when you had to hire an employee, and you're like, well, okay, they have to be local and then I have maybe I want them to do video editing for my company but I only maybe have five hours well who's going to come to a part-time job or who am I going to get for five hours okay so now I have to give them more work so that I can get the hours up because I really need that help but then you're diluting the talent they're doing other things that they're not good at so right. when you're hiring somebody for social media you want to start small you want to be clear and you want to expand on and lean into what they're good at where too many times people dilute that and they also think too, like, I get this a lot from my clients. Well, my business is different. Everybody says that. And what I want to do is, you know, share with you a, a, one of my clients. She was a interior designer. She's like, Chris, okay. I walk into a room. I see stuff. I can't describe it. it. You know, there's nothing you can do here. I'm like, okay. So we examined what she was doing and any sort of documentation or stuff or stuff she sat down with the client when she first got there we ripped it all apart we looked at her average meeting was about two hours well we broke it all down and we realized there was pre-work and post-work that we could do that was administrative and she didn't have to do it even though it was about design there was a formula for it and we we right. showed her where the formula and the patterns because there's always patterns in what you do even if you're a brain surgeon there's patterns of behavior in what you do so we got her appointments down to like 45 minutes sometimes an hour so then she started stacking all her morning appointments to do these hands-on stuff. And in the afternoons, now she's on all these stages speaking or pre-pandemic, of course, but she's, you know, on podcast, she's doing all these really high profile stuff that's bringing a lot of attention 
like to her business. It's unbelievable. And it was because we took her work and we compressed it. So her creation mode was much bigger. That's huge. That's huge. So let me ask you this. Um, I, I love kind of like breaking things down. I think that's huge. One of the things I've I've personally had struggles with, and, and I know I've talked with a number of entrepreneurs, especially when we're outsourcing and particularly to foreign countries, is oftentimes the language barrier. And, you know, even if you go someplace like the Philippines, where they generally speak English very, very well, uh, there's even like a, I don't know if it's like a cultural barrier or, you know, one of the things I see is, oh, well, you said to do exactly this and there was no critical thinking outside. It's like, hey, I executed this single thing right here as is. And sometimes they don't think past that single task to what the impact of that task might have in other things. Um, so, and I, and again, this is something I've heard, not not just experienced myself, but heard mm -hmm. from other entrepreneurs. So how, how do you handle that when, when, you're, when you're doing this? Because I think sometimes it's going to create more work for you in the long term or, or mistakes, which could be costly. Yeah. The interesting piece about that, Bob, is both those symptoms you're talking about you do encounter in a local workforce so you know i'm in canada you're in the us it's a multicultural world you definitely could have people come work for you that are new to the country or have been here quite some time and have an accent or whatever so that you know that that really kind of i don't want to say is irrelevant but th that's a common place no matter where you hire from secondly Part of bringing also, people on board yeah yeah and i would also say too it is how you onboard them and train them and the culture. So we are very big in our onboarding process of educating people that this is a different place to work. We are hiring you to think. There's going to be things, processes follow, but we are hiring you because of your personality over your skill set. And this is what we're looking for. We're looking for thinkers. We're looking for ideas. Most businesses, especially in the bigger organizations and corporate, they are parentified. So here, mommy's in a bad mood, daddy, <laughs> the CEO is cranky because the company's doing this or that, whatever. And you just little minions, you go around, you try to get stuff done, but you're not taught or encouraged to raise your hand and do come up with these big, great ideas. But you kind of like, you're just staying in your lane and doing your job. And then you then you look at these people you're bringing on and going, oh, it's a cultural thing. Yes, the Philippines are known for being obedient. But I have Filipino people on my team. And boy, oh boy, they keep me in shape. And they bring fantastic ideas to the table. And they will are, advocate for things that I say, well, I think we should do this way. Well, let me show you why we shouldn't. Oh, okay, great. Mm. So the joke is, I always say, I want to be the dumbest person in the room. And weekly in our meetings, I say, well, good, I'm still the dumbest person in the room because that was <laughs> a great idea. So it's really about the infrastructure, which is what we talk a lot about with our coaching clients is the onboarding process and our super toolkits and how to, you do really need to make that part of your onboarding process and you need to mean it and say it and show it and lead it because that's not just the Philippines. That is most workplaces. Perfect. So I want to go back for a second. You said you mentioned culture, and I think that's a huge part of it. You said, hey, we want people to think and have ideas. So what do you do to build your culture to someone who doesn't know anything about your culture yet? In terms of how do you do you explain it to them? Do you talk about it? Do you show it to them? Like what what's your process that they go? You're, I guess you're creating a filter for someone who goes, no, that's, that's not for me. I'm not looking for that kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, a part of our hiring process, you're not going to get somebody that says that's not for me. That's not kind of our stuff because we're going to eliminate mm -hmm. that in the hiring process. Perfect. And then when we do that and we start to onboard them, we really, we call it out and identify it. So they get a little video training. They get a little cheat sheet. We educate them and we say, this is very different than anywhere else you've worked before. This is what we're looking for. Then when we have what we call our scrum, our little scrum meetings, you know, they might say something, I'll say they'll try something and it didn't work out. And they'll say, oh, I'm so sorry. I say, hey, save your sorries for when you need it. Like, don't just throw sorries around. So I call them out on it and they mm. will learn. The other people on the team will say, yeah, it's different here. You know, I would <laughs> rather hear three bad ideas and get one out of that than not hear any ideas. Like right. it's, it's really easy to edit versus create. So they just see in the way that I lead, but we call them out on that a lot in the beginning and we encourage them and say, you know, here's an example. Um, today in our scrum meeting, our student, we have a student, you guys can all have students. Um, we've had about 30 now. This year alone, we've got about 800 hours of free labor. 
you know, free admin skill, high tech skills, graphic design stuff from local high schools. When they're in grade 11, 12 now, they got a lot of talent because they came wow. into this world with a cell phone in their hand, right? So great point. Yeah. So we've used them for over the years or whatever. And so even Lee, who's been with us just a couple of weeks, but he had an onboarding process with us and stuff. I was about to end the meeting and I said, okay, any, any questions? Great, great meetings done. Let's get out of here. And he goes, oh, excuse me, hold on. You asked me last week to do research on something and do a presentation for you. I said, oh, you're right. Now Lee knew, Lee knew by our culture that he could not come back next week and say, oh, but Chris, you ended the meeting. Our company rules, let's say you had to get an email out, but you needed a picture from me. You can't come back next week and say, Chris, you didn't give me the picture. You have to keep coming to me until I put my hand up and say, listen, I'm in the hospital. They're not sure, but they think it's <laughs> internal bleeding. <laughs> so I probably won't get that to you today. Like they have to be told really aggressively stop until they get that from me. It's their job to manage me, not to me to manage them. But even Lee, that. who's only been here a couple of weeks, he knew that was on him to speak up and take charge of the situation. So he took charge and said, no, before it ends, this is what I need to show you. It should take about 10 minutes. And I'm like, all oh, right, totally. Yay for Lee, right? So we really create a culture hard and fast in the beginning of what we're looking for. And frankly, once they see that I mean it, they're really inspired by it. It's really mm. exciting for them because they get to spread their wings and come up with ideas and contribute. They're not order takers. That's perfect. That's perfect. So what are you doing to create to create that for them before they even get to the interview? Like, is it a question? Like, do you, I'm just, I'm just curious. Cause you know, like for example, I, we have on our company, we have our core values on our, our website. And I, the first thing I do before anything is say, Hey, take a look at those and then tell me what you think about them. Like that's a question that I ask them before they even get any further. And nine times out of 10, someone will be like, Oh yeah, they're good. I'm like, well, clearly that wasn't, you know, if you read them, you'd know you need to send something more than they're good. Um, but I would, I'm curious, what other things do you do to filter people out to find the right kind of person? Here's the problem with your core values. Lots of people say things, but doing it and saying it are two different things, right? right? So you can say you believe in something, but are you going to inconvenience yourself to support that, right? right. And also, what's your definition of that? So if I'm like, oh, I'm all about hearing ideas, and then they find two weeks in, it's like, oh, when she's in a good mood, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> what's my definition of that? So I do believe in what we call the, you know, do they pass P A S S. So I always hire personality over skill set because you can change it. You know, you can give them a skill set, but you can't change a personality. We also talk about action. So when I go to hire someone, there's a couple of little tricks I do. Like even when I invite them to the interview, I ask them to come respond to me at this email. It's a new email address to let me know if they're interested. Will they be attending the interview? I look how quickly they respond, how they talk to me. I give what we call little action steps to see how they take action. Mm -hmm. Then I talk about success in the interview. I'll ask them what's a success for them. It's very telling by when somebody defines what a success is for them, that you'd be surprised the things that they tell you. Right. And then last and maybe least is their skill set. So to me, there's the little things that we put in play when we're onboarding. Because again, we onboard and hire for our coaching clients. And then we we bring them to a meeting, we introduce them to you and you get the final say, but they go through a 12 step process before you get to meet them. And the reason we do that is because we're helping you with your super toolkits, getting your company all set up, getting your work compressed to like 40% admin so you can do 60% creation. And you don't have time for the learning curves of a new hire. So we do that for you. So it's really a lot of is done in the pre-qualifying, but say you do things is very different than showing them you mean it. Right. I love that. So I'm curious, what are, what are some bad examples and maybe a couple of good examples of definitions of success by people, at least from your experience? You know, people will tell you silly things. So what I really, I don't really care what somebody does. I care about what they felt was behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, somebody might say success, like, you know, what? for me, success was I am, I'm still working somewhere else. And this came up in the meeting and there was conflict. And normally I would just put my head down and it, it's how they dealt with a problem in the workplace or a success for them was they addressed it, you know, in the meeting instead of just taking the hit saying, look, 
Um, that's not how it happened. And, and they might say to me, that was a really big deal for me. There was 10 people in the room and I, you know, I was a little bit nervous, but I was really proud of myself that what I didn't want to do is leave nervous and beat myself up later for the rest of the day. So I don't even care what the situation was. I like the growth in their explanation of their journey. So for me, the success is where they saw the growth. I think that's very insightful when somebody tells you why that was a success for them is really powerful, right? So it's really just listening to the subtext of the story has great meaning. I don't care if somebody says I ran a 5k, that's great. Unless they said, look, you know what? I was kind of embarrassed about my body. And then I didn't even want to be in shorts, but I just said to heck with it. And there, you know, so it's really, the, again, the subtext. So it's stuff like that, that really tells you about the character of somebody. And I find that to be very helpful. That's hundred percent. I get yeah. it. I get it. It's funny. My first job out of college, uh, did the interview and it was a phone interview and the whole, and like, I'm like beforehand, like prepping all my knowledge for like what the, you know, like the technology and all this. And literally there was not a single question about what I knew. It was all, tell me about a time in which this happened. And they, they would ask me tell, to tell stories about situations that I was in. And I remember going, like getting done with the interview going, that was the weirdest interview I've ever been on. Cause I'd never been on an interview like that before. Every other interview I've been through, um, which had mostly been for large companies like fortune 500 type companies. They didn't want you to think or a situation. They wanted yeah. to say, can you do this? And can you execute this in this order from, from us? It's actually even funny. The, my internship was with a fortune 500 company and on my review sheet with the college, my boss had written asks too many questions. Oh, <laughs> See? And I was like, that that should have been my indication that I was probably not going to be well suited for a, a corporate career. See, I tell them to treat like they get paid for questions. I say, I want you to think like you get paid extra for questions because the questions tell me what they're thinking. Mm. That's, all, you know, they showed me their train of thought, right? It's like, so then it, there are, <laughs> somebody said once there's no, I always say there's no stupid questions, but somebody said there are no stupid questions, but there are stupid people <laughs> asking questions, right? But, I always say, they're literally from stage, someone will, because, and most of my events, someone will come up and say, oh, I, well, I have, I have a really stupid question, or, or, you know, raise your hand, I have a stupid question, but like, whoa, 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 there are no stupid questions, but there are a lot of inquisitive idiots, so go ahead. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. usually like, wait, what? Yeah. So I ask them to, because it really shows what they're looking at, and then it often, I feel, shows what information I didn't give, or like, oh, that's a great question, I, I can see how you totally are over there, but that's not what I'm talking about, so I'm mm. all about the questions. That's perfect. That's perfect. Interesting. That's just funny how how different the worlds can be of of and especially and I, I think a lot of us, a lot of entrepreneurs, especially because they, if they're not starting when they're young, they're starting coming from that corporate direction. And a lot of times, there's not cultures like that. So now you're you're literally yeah. trying to create something that's the opposite of what you need for for success. Yeah, and then we blame it on the poor Filipino culture. But I would argue totally that's true. not that that's everywhere. You most of jobs are in a very parentified system and you are to stay in a lane to do work mm -hmm. that was executed by somebody who doesn't do the job or did it a long time ago and they they're not encouraging you to shake up the system and come up with ideas and oh we tried that 10 years ago whatever oh he's joe from sales he's always doing like pfft. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's not just that it, it's the mindset of an employee and how we were all brought into the workplace. That's perfect. That's perfect. So what, uh, you know, aside from just your own, your own book, what other books would you recommend for someone who's wanting to learn about culture or, or trying to create that culture? Cause I, I would argue that, uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs that I've met and maybe even a lot of them that are listening to this show right now have either never thought about culture or if they have, it's in this context of oh, when I'm big enough, I'll get to that point, but they don't think about that. It starts with themselves. I think. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I do know, and I, I say this, you know, not to brag, but people tell me all the time that we do this very differently than anybody out there. And I don't know of a book that talks about culture because what happens, culture is often associated with big organizations. How could I have a culture? There's me and a exactly. student and somebody else working five hours. But you can't fall into a healthy culture with 200 people when you don't have that kind of team with three, right? right. And so... You know, as I said, too, even in the beginning of the hour, I talked about losing my husband. I mean, he truly was my best friend. We were a great team. We had a lot of fun together. 
And my team got me through that, but I showed up every day with everything I could in the beginning after losing him is I, it, I had a good excuse to show up and be somber or be whatever I wanted to be. But I was purposeful that I am responsible for the energy I bring into the room and they don't need to be looking at my sad face every day to the point that, you know, right before he passed away, I remember Evan, who was, has been with us a couple of years by that point. Now he's been with us like seven years. And I came in, I was trying to be positive because I was going to, something came up and I was trying to explain to him and he said, so help me God, Chris, if you come in here one more time and you put a positive spin on the most horrific story that I've heard, he said, I can't take it. My nerves are raw. Like he said, <laughs> I, he said, you got to stop. You're killing me. He goes, this is so sad. So they were sadder. Not that they were sadder than I was. They brought more sadness to work because they knew him and stuff. And I felt, right. you know, they, it's not fair for them to go through the grieving process with me for a couple of years. So I had to figure out how do I show up and give my best and yes, acknowledge that there's missing pieces here that I have to deal with, but but it's not going to be fun to work for somebody who's sad for three years. So I'm not saying put a bandaid on it and then I pretended to be somebody it wasn't. But I I had to be really purposeful during that time of how I was going to lead and what was the culture of the company going to be. So there's always a reason, stress, finances, pandemic, whatever. But you have to lead and so that you can lean on them and so that they can be in creation mode and so that they know they have that license to do it. Not like, Oh, well, she meant that before, but she's been through a lot. So let's not bring up a new idea. So you have to be purposeful and deliberate. I like that. That's good. So what do you think makes your culture different? You said, you said a number of times that yours is just very different than any place else. What are those items that you feel like are different than anywhere else? And why do you like them? Well, I think that everyone keeps telling me and my coaching clients as well, when we teach them this stuff, that's different for them. So I think the big things are we, I am all about constantly being in the creation mode. And that means the team as well. So I'm always looking at their work and saying, how can we compress your work? So it's more and more efficient. So you can do more and more creation work instead of just doing redundant or repetitive tasks and say, okay, that's what that person does and it's handled. So I'm looking at how can we improve that? Because if you're in creation mode, then it, it enhances me. Like recently um, with our podcast, when they are, when the day, we were all super excited that we were close to 200 five-star reviews on iTunes. Thought it was great. This is good news. We'll make a banner. We'll celebrate. And then Ruby, my podcast manager came back to me because we're always tweaking, especially the podcast where there's so many moving parts and we're going to double the output. She came back to me and she had found this place where she's like, Chris, there's all these Stitcher reviews that we don't know about. And we have 900 five-star reviews, over 900. And I was like, no. <laughs> you, well, because <laughs> she has time in her creation. And because podcasts still are kind of relatively not new, but they're still, you know what I mean? It's still, it's a growing area. She's constantly Untapped. researching. Yeah, she's researching. She's growing. She's looking at stuff. She's joining groups. She's taking things. She's doing all this stuff and coming back saying, okay, this is what's happening. You can now be searched here. You can now be do that. So she's mm -hmm. constantly in creation mode. So she brings stuff to us that we're like, really? We can do that now? Are you kidding me? And these were 900 insanely thought out detailed reviews that even reading them, I was like, Oh, I want to print them and just wallpaper my walls with them. So <laughs> she had just been a do this, get this done mode. She wouldn't be bringing all these fantastic things to the table. So I'm all about having them in a bigger percentage of creation mode as well as me. It's not just about me and just teaching them to ask questions and, and just, it's all about creation, creation ideas to execution. That's what being an entrepreneur is about. I love it. I love it. Now, question for you. Do you meet with your team, you know, virtually via Zoom, video call, whatever, on a regular basis, even if they're outsourced? Because I've, I've, it's interesting. I was on a, I think it was a training call. This is probably in August of last year. And the guy said, different points of view. I'm not going to say he was wrong, but his point was VAs don't want to be on video calls with you. So don't have video calls. Don't talk to them. Everything can be done through text and only needs to be done that way. And I was like, man, I struggle with that. The idea of that, that seems like it would just be, it would create a disconnect between you and your team is how I would feel. But um, I'm curious what your take is on that. 
There are a lot of people that don't want to do that because of their setup, but now with Zoom and stuff, they can just have a background that covers their background, stuff like that. I will not have someone work for us that we can't meet through video and they will also yeah. not be hired for one of my coaching clients. It really changes the world when you look at their face and you see their face and you hear their laugh. It's also more clarity, more conversation, more sense of team. So we, it's all virtual, whether they're local, whatever, everybody hops on the Zoom call. We have little scrum meetings. So I, depending what we're working on, I I have a scrum meeting, which is about 15 minutes, Monday to Thursday, every morning. And then we have a team meeting once a week. And we just for those who don't know what a scrum meeting is, I do, but I'm, I'm someone here might not. Yeah, it's from a book and it's also about rugby that you get in a little scrum and it's meant to be intense and short. And also really, I also subscribe to other philosophies where if you're having a meeting that's long enough that you have to sit down, you're not running your meeting well. So <laughs> they're just 15 minute meetings, but they're really purposeful to highlight things and move stuff forward. It's not like to go through some crazy agenda. So we have little scrums Monday to Thursday, and then we have a team meeting where we go over a lot of stuff and stats and all these kinds of things about a podcast, social media once a week. And it's about a 40 minute meeting once a week with six that's, people. Yeah. That, that's, that's a, that's like a world record right there of meetings. Yeah. <laughs> usually, usually it's like, Oh, we need the agenda. Let's have a meeting to talk about the meeting. Yeah, no, no, we don't do that. We do not mess around. Yeah. Yeah. I remember I, I was, there was a, a company that at one point, uh, <laughs> they were like, Oh, we're going to do all these meetings. And I got to a point where literally I had eight hours of meetings a week. And I said to them, I said, look, this is not productive. I don't care that you read some book that told you that this is what it is. I'm going to straight up tell you right now that I'm in eight hours of meetings and six of those eight hours, I say the same thing to just yeah. different groups of people. And this doesn't make sense. And they're like, no, 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 we got to keep doing it. And I was like, I'm not going to keep doing this. Like I literally said, I'm not doing it. I was like, I'll do this one because this is important. This is like a top down meeting. Everything else can go from there. And people like we can record it and they can watch it if we need to, or I don't know something, else, but I'm not going to keep doing eight hours a week of meetings. That's insane. Um, and I remember like in this particular instance, it, it was just like, everyone was feeling the same, but it was interesting. The culture wasn't to question that the culture was, well, this came from the top three. Therefore we must do it and don't question it. And I just, I, to me, I'm like, what, what? Like it was to me, that was mind blowing. And so it, anyways, the, the point of that story is that if you're thinking about it, if you're watching this or listening to this, are you creating that kind of methodology? Like, are you creating the space for you to be, you would do what I say and nothing else? Or are you creating something more like what Chris has, where it's like, Hey, I encourage questions. I encourage people to, to drop in. And I would argue that for a small business, encouraging people to take ownership of things and question things is going to be more productive in the long term. Maybe more frustrating. Um, it might hurt your ego a little bit more, but if you're trying to build a business, the bigger business you have, the more your ego should be happy, I would think. So it's uh, kind of both. Yeah. My social media manager just the other day, she sent me a thing that she saw online and she was showing me on LinkedIn, you have your name, Chris Ward, and then you have win the hour, win the day underneath it. And she showed me a little clip and she said, look, people, here's a new thing. You're wasting everyone who doesn't care about your company name, put your name and what you do for them under that. And I'm like, ah. Oh. Mm. Oh, that's a good tip. Okay. I went in and I changed it right away on LinkedIn. So she's bringing this stuff to me. Hey, I just saw this and we're not doing it. All right. I'm on it. It's done. So I would have like, Oh, look at my profile. It's quite nice. I, I wouldn't have known <laughs> to look for that, but she's out there coming and bringing stuff to the table. Cause she's in creation mode. Yeah. And just looking at it from a different, different yeah. set. I mean, I know, heck, a number of times I look at something and then someone's like, how did you not see that? I was like, I've looked at this so many times. I don't know that I would have seen anything, no matter how big yeah. or glaring it was uh, at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, this this has been great. Um, I could probably keep going for another hour, but uh, I'll be respectful of your time and our listeners' time. Uh, so, who? Yeah, who? There, my my brain literally. I'm like going through more questions in it, but it's okay. Uh, where can people find more about you? Uh, check out. I know you said your site was winthehourwintheday.com. If they want to get your book, like, what's the best place for them to go to connect with you if they want to? Listen, Bob, I will always come back for you. So part two, <laughs> <laughs> just call me and we'll we come back. Cause there is, I do think there's a lot to dive in here and unpack. And I think the saddest thing about this, which is what breaks my heart is people are working in isolation and trying to do right by them and their family and stuff. And this is why I'm so passionate about it is because you ask some phenomenal questions that people are just going on the assumption that this is how it's done. And it was right. done at their job, you know, in the last 20 years and stuff. And so how do they not know to, they think they're doing right and being a big boy or girl and following what was happening in the corporate world, but it's not working. And that's why you left that. So I'm happy to come back at any time. Reach out to me on any of the socials. Say you heard me on this fantastic podcast. Send me a message on LinkedIn. 
Hey, you can even reach me because of Bob on my personal email, Chris, K-R-I-S-W-A-R-D, Chris Ward at winthehourwintheday.com. Perfect. Perfect. So definitely everyone check that out. And as always, thank you for dropping in, giving this a listen, watching it, wherever you're checking it out from truly appreciate it. Uh, as always, I ask one small favor. If you like this or you know someone who would find value, just share it. That's all you got to do. It takes nothing. One of the most amazing things that we have the power to today to do is impact a business simply by engaging with them through sharing, through commenting, liking, uh, leaving a review, whatever it is. Not all that just takes a little bit of time, but it makes a huge impact. And that's the whole point of this is to make an impact on people's lives, their businesses and where they're going. Otherwise, I'd just be having conversations for the sake of having conversations, but I love making impact at the same time. So thank you so much for sharing, rating, reviewing, subscribing, whatever it is, hit the bells, hit the buttons, click the things, do the stuff. You know what it is, wherever you are. I appreciate you all. And we'll see you on another great episode next week. Thanks so much, Chris. Appreciate having you here too. Thank you.